we've been going for about 19 years or so and worked with a number of customers over a number of different countries. Um, my role specifically has been in the deployment of Abacus, um, giving users and customers and companies, I guess, some advice on, on how to, to use Abacus, but more so what kind of decisions that they can build or support and by using a tool. Um, one of the main, I guess, challenges as well um, specifically would be you know, how a enterprise architecture tool is actually embedded internally. Um, a lot of companies that we tend to deal with uh, probably come over from various aspects, including you know, Visio, Excel, probably legacy applications as well. So the idea um, behind Abacus, of course, is to make sure that we provide this platform that users can import data easily into, and they can interact with that data, they can collaborate on that, and they can use some of the more cutting edge um, features or functionalities that we have to effectively analyze and simulate um, some of the data that they might have within the tool. Um, that analysis, that um, simulation aspect is something I'll touch on during the rest of the slides. Um, but certainly from an Abacus perspective, what we're trying to do is give this overall platform. You know, it's something that you can start plugging data into. It's not something Thing that should exist in isolation, of course. Hopefully, that's what we move away from. Um, and the idea is to just get people talking. You know, we need to get people communicating um, about the work that they're actually doing internally as well. Um, but on to, I guess, the, the main topic around um, application transformation. So I guess the, the key thing would be a lot of the time, certainly some of the companies that we work with, you know, there's a focus to always adopting the newest technology. You know, how do we push things to cloud? How do we talk about big data? Where are the aspects of the market that we actually need to develop and innovate in? I guess what tends to get left behind is this overall, effectively consumer-based way of legacy applications. What that tends to do um, is actually introduce a few challenges. So typically, um, these are some of the surveys that I guess some of ourselves have done in terms of consultants, but also analysts as well. Um, what you typically find is that most companies, and um, certainly on average, typically can save between it's about 20 and 30 percent um, of its IT budget by retiring redundant applications. Now, that's a, a significant proportion, um, and of course, that varies across various industries and domains. But it's also important to remember that when we talk about application transformation, a lot of it starts with just managing the data. You know, how do we actually get a centralized repository of all the components, all the applications, all the instances that we have internally, and how do we actually start making sure that we make use of that data? Um, Gartner, of course, backs this up as well, um, another analyst report here, um, and how that's actually important. Um, it probably became a bit more evident, I guess, during the pandemic as well, and um, certainly when everyone's working from home, there's maybe a tendency that new applications have to be installed. Um, there's maybe a lack of um, knowing what's out there already, what can be reused. So it's always good to understand how we can actually manage these particular portfolios. There is a key question to this, though. You know, what is an application? Um, I'm certainly not going to spend the next you know, six hours talking to you about what is an application. Um, you'll see various discussions across our community, various other communities about what an application is. Um, it could be, you know, things that op operate on specific platforms. They enable capabilities or processes. There are various definitions for what an application is. And I think over time, it tends to develop. The important aspect of all of this usually is not necessarily what everyone else classifies an application as, but what you classify the application as internally. It could be an Excel spreadsheet you know, that is probably supporting some process or capability. It's delivering some kind of functionality, it's probably used by the rest of the organization, and it probably is manipulating or exchanging some data. So again, there's, there are definitions available from certain industry standards or frameworks or methodologies, but it's about defining what an application is internally for you. Um, application transformation as well, I think, is, is the title of the slides for a specific purpose. We're not purely talking about application rationalization. 
Um, certainly something I've seen over the past seven, eight years, just working for Evolution. Um, there does tend to be a, a tendency for um, various users to kind of, you know, fairly communicate internally, I hopefully, but certainly go onto these architectural board meetings and say, hey, we've tried to reduce our application portfolio. We've retired 25 applications. Look at the significant change we're making. And that's all well and good. Um, but you also have to consider how many applications you're pulling into production. You know, you might be introducing new applications. That tends to dwarf the amount that you're actually retiring. You can actually take that a step further. You know, there are a whole bunch of systems and applications that we don't even know about. So that proportion of retired applications, again, becomes less and less the more we actually start exposing the data and collecting all of this information. So yes, rationalization is important. I guess it's one of the things that reduces cost, obviously a key um, indicator, I guess. Um, but transformation itself um, is usually a bit more important. So there are what we've outlined as, I guess, the four steps to a successful application transformation. So capture, maintain, analyze, and optimize. Um, capture being the first one is effectively where we have to start looking at how we actually bring the content into a centralized system. A part of this is a definition process to some extent. Um, a lot of the time, you know, if, if you're trying to actually implement um, a tool or even without a tool, um, trying to collect all the information can be a, a bit of a nightmare, can be a bit of a headache. Um, so you do want to make sure that you get the whole organization involved. You know, walk the floor, see what's going on, understand what systems people are using, who the owners of those systems are, what they're using those systems for, and then actually start building up a portfolio for that. Um, Shadow IT, I guess, uh, hopefully, uh, because we're not too overused these days, but certainly is another aspect and another reason for trying to capture and centralize all this information. You want to make sure that you have some kind of inventory. That doesn't mean it has to be all manual, of course. Um, and it also doesn't mean that you'll get to a stage where it's 100% complete. You know, it's maybe an overused saying again, but we should probably never aim for 100%. So there's always going to be aspects that probably shift um, beyond our control. But one of the key things to emphasize is using the existing data portfolios that you have. Sometimes when people think they have to use an EA tool or a deployment of an EA tool, um, there's maybe a, a level of fear in terms of, you know, oh, we've got so many disparate systems, we don't know how to collate that all. It's effectively a, a case of starting small. You don't want any tool that you use just to be another CMDB that you have to maintain. So make sure you're plugging in bits from Excel sheets that you have, maybe using existing sources like ServiceNow or SharePoint lists, trying to make sure that all the systems that you currently have embedded are being used and are being collated into one platform. Now, there's a reason for that as well. Um, all of these other systems contain different types of data. So as much as we talk around application transformation, we also need to be aware that there are other aspects of this. So visual diagrams that you've drawn or maybe you want to import into a tool. You want to understand why the applications exist. What capabilities are they supporting? what processes are using those applications, maybe where they're hosted. These are the other aspects of Abacus that tend to get linked together then. So as much as there are four steps, I guess, in our case to application transformation, there are, of course, other aspects to consider. One of the key aspects is maybe, again, maybe there's a slight confusion of the terminology, I guess, but it's the technology-based views. You know, we have an application or a system that's supporting some kind of process or capability. That's usually um, built on top of various technologies. So connecting to something like Technopedia, um, which is effectively a source of uh, software and hardware standards, contains lifecycle dates, cost values, I think even sometimes SLA values. This is where we can actually start understanding some of the impacts that shifts in technology will have on our application portfolios. Again, from an application perspective, that also introduces the concept of vendor, especially when it comes to other aspects, which we'll discuss a bit more later on. You know, risk, especially, is a key thing. 
if we have a whole application portfolio that's reliant on a single vendor, clearly there's going to be a higher level of risk. So as with anything, it's about trying to spread that risk across the organization, have various vendors contributing applications, and of course, making sure as usual that we capture all of that information. So make use of those built-in integrations. Now, once we have that data, and that's usually the easy bit, um, most people think the difficulty is in maintaining. Um, and there are certain aspects of maintaining that pose a few challenges. The first, I guess, is the level or the scale of data. You know, we have all of these different systems that we've now captured, all the applications, the, the relationships that they have with each other, the various departments and the organizations, the processes that they perform, the applications that support those processes, you might soon find yourself get to a stage where it might seem overwhelming. So as usual, and with great amount of data comes great responsibility, it's our job to make sure that we actually maintain this in a state that's usable. Now, applications probably a bit easier to maintain. Um, let's say things like technologies, um, obviously a bit more difficult, hence the use of something like Technopedia because things change a bit quicker in those spaces. But certainly from an application perspective, we can actually make use of those existing integrations. It's also important, I guess, to remember that there is always going to be some manual work. You know, we can't always rely on all of the integrations working, especially when we have the need to have input from users. So you've heard of things like, um, you know, data reports being produced, interviews, surveys. These are, of course, useful for maybe that initial capture, but you want to make sure that users have this collaborative environment to work in. So making changes, making Excel changes maybe was the old way. Hopefully the new way is actually having this integrated platform and centralizing it. The other thing I guess maybe quickly worth emphasizing is, you know, we come across as maybe an enterprise architecture tool, and this is certainly the space that we work in. Um, but you also kind of want to reduce the barrier to entry for a lot of users. You know, yes, they might want to contribute information, but they don't need to learn some EA tool that they might be worried about. So embedding this type of information in Teams, which has clearly got a huge adoption these days, integrating it into maybe Confluence or SharePoint, at least allowing those users to work in the environment that they're used to um, is one of the, the key things um, for making sure that this data maintains itself. The other key thing for maintenance of the data, of course, is ownership. We need to have some kind of owners of this information so that then we can notify them when changes are made. We need to make sure they're updated when there are maybe indirect relationships that are affecting their application portfolio. And as usual, some of the use cases you'll see throughout um, the event today and certainly some of our case studies, making sure that it's available for users to use tends to reveal some hidden information. You know, if you've got an application portfolio that you've published, users will contribute when they maybe don't see their application. So you're trying to, again, move some of that shadow IT that I mentioned earlier on. There are also some more cutting edge aspects to maintaining the data as well. So machine learning um, is certainly one of the things that we've developed in Abacus over the years. Um, it's one of those aspects that tends to help fill in the blanks, I guess, is the, is the best way of saying this. Um, machine learning itself um, is, is pretty widely known, I would hope. Um, certainly some of the larger companies use it. Um, Amazon use it for, you know, I guess I'll say trustworthy reviews. Um, PayPal use it for things like transaction fraud. Various companies use machine learning to analyze the information they have. What we're trying to do um, from a machine learning aspect is just to try and remove the guesswork. You know, we try to make business decisions. Hopefully this can help influence or at least maybe direct us in the right area. Again, it's not in isolation. It's machine learning based on the data that we've imported, user entered data. It's actually built on predictions of all the information that's available. And again, you know, this isn't, isn't kind of rise of the machines aspect. All your architects, all your users will, of course, make the overriding decision. You don't have to approve any of the changes that Abacus might suggest. You can actually, as architects, make that informed decision. But again, hopefully this is giving you some insights into that information. 
Um, this is data points, which is what we're referencing here in terms of machine learning. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised to see in the next um, few months, even a few years, you know, these machine learning aspects will might eventually provide structure recommendations. They might even suggest model recommendations. So not just data points to be filled in, but maybe even entire architectures. Now, we've captured the information. We are hopefully maintaining the information. And the next thing we need to do, of course, is analyze all of that data. Um, as you've heard so far, of course, that data doesn't really mean anything unless we actually build those information models and provide some kind of insight. A lot of that does come down, of course, to perspective. So we have various data points that are floating around in an organization. Um, and the key thing usually is to tr try and build those data points into different perspectives. Um, there's a couple of kind of, I guess, GIFs working on the screen here. Um, some of them are actually a bit more useful than others, but certainly the one on the left is an interesting case. Um, this was actually a statistics project by um, someone called Alberto Cairo. Um, it's effectively a list of all the data points. Um, and no matter what format they pass through, as you can see in this image here, um, they actually all have exactly the same outputs, the same standard deviation, the same mean value, the same correlation. It's all exactly the same output, except it's structured slightly differently. And likewise, on the right, one of the things we want to emphasize is what seemingly seems like random data points at the beginning soon end up becoming these models that you build. You're trying to build structures from the information or from the data that you have to provide something useful. So hopefully something a bit more useful than a star plot or a dinosaur appearing. But the idea is to start using this information and then actually start using it to measure the outputs. So we have random data points, perhaps. The insights come from this metric-based analysis that we then perform. So again, we might have captured all the applications that exist, the owners, what capabilities or processes they support. Now we actually probably want to take a bit more of an objective approach to this. What are some of the key characteristics of those applications? What kind of properties or attributes do we want to capture to actually analyze the information? Some of the headline ones, I guess, um, tend to fall into cost and risk and impact. Um, cost is, is, of course, not a surprise. Cost tends to drive a lot of things. Um, but cost should also be represented in different ways. Um, we've done a few of these TBM conferences and various other conferences before on, on various topics, of course. Um, one of the ones we did before, actually, was on technical debt. Um, trying to convince someone from a business perspective why technical debt is bad um, always becomes quite difficult, um, especially if you're calculating that based on you know, the time it takes to write a line of code or the number of legacy systems that we have internally. Translating that to some kind of cost metric usually does a good job of trying to sell that vision, let's say. You know, if we reduce this tech debt, we can potentially have this cost saving. Or depending on what type of market you're in, of course, that will vary on the type of output you produce. Now, risk, again, is an important aspect and certainly impact is. But most of these metrics tend to come from, I guess, maybe just reviewing the data or providing some kind of subjective view. You know, we think the cost could decrease if we retire these applications. We think there's less risk if we move things to cloud. We think there's going to be less impact if we retire this server and not this one. What we want to try and do is take an objective approach. The way we tend to do that is through what we call algorithms. Um, so we've actually implemented a number of algorithms out of the box with Abacus. But what we've also tried to do is emphasize this no code based approach. No code um, is probably something that you've also heard of recently. It becomes more and more um, frequent in a lot of the studies. Um, it's certainly an aspect of Abacus that allows you to build your own algorithms to then drive a certain output. There are some key aspects of this, um, especially when we take a look at applications. One of the one of the metrics, or certainly two of the metrics we try to capture is what we call a business fit or a technical fit score. So how well does the application sit within its portfolio? So for business fit, we consider things like maybe cost, uh, the number of processes it supports, um, how many users there are. 
technical fit, we might be considering whether it's a cloud-based or a desktop-based application. Is it using obsolete or out-of-date technology? Maybe it's still using you know, Windows 7 and of support January this year, so hopefully we need to fix things like that. But those algorithms can then calculate that relative business fit and technical fit score. That's useful in its own right, but what that tends to do then is snowball into other areas. Because what that really does is it influences the strategic recommendations we make. If it has a low biz tech fit score, then we probably want to retire the application. If it has a high biz tech fit score, probably something we want to invest or innovate in. Now, there's a whole bunch of algorithms that we've thought up of with customers, with analysts throughout our community. People have made some kind of weird and wonderful algorithms. Certainly the highlighting ones here are things like the complexity of our landscape, the availability of applications, maybe based on the, the reliability of the server it's hosted on. There are certainly aspects of the data that's important. The key thing is trying to take a bit more of an objective approach. That does combine aspects of maintaining, configuring, machine learning, but algorithms really do provide you with an ability to analyze information for a specific output. So it becomes very useful to have these no code based ways. One of the final steps um, is, or certainly the final step, I guess in this case, is to optimize. Um, Optimization comes in many forms. Um, if you've heard us speak before, we've talked around things like multiple architectures, and I'll certainly get onto that. Um, but I really want to try and focus partly on the dashboarding aspects. And um, when it comes to optimizing the information, so far what we've seen is we've captured the information in a tool, we're maintaining it in the tool, we're analyzing it in the tool. Eventually, we want to get to a stage where we're actually exposing this to the rest of the company so that we can actually collaborate on this a bit more. One of the ways we found that to be very useful is through the um, addition of dashboards. So dashboards would give you effectively a collection of views. And really what we're trying to do is focus the audience. You know, a lot of the time, especially from an, an EA perspective, we're probably overwhelmed by the number of data points or the number of domains we're working in. By having dashboards, we can actually tailor the information for a specific audience, for a specific view. Of course, they can explore other areas, but we really want to try and focus their attention on something specific that we're working on. So there are some general rules of thumb in here. Um, we've provided extensive WebExes before about best practices, for visualizations, um, but some of the key aspects of here, of course, is to keep it simple and also choose the right KPI. We've got some articles on how to choose the best KPI, but certainly something that's worked very well for our customers is to build this, this type of um, spreadsheet, let's say, or this type of table. You want to understand who you're presenting to. But to do that, of course, you have to have some kind of goal or objective in mind. There's usually two aspects of this as well. We're either asking questions and expecting an answer um, or we're just looking for an answer without actually knowing what questions to ask. So again, take an objective approach. Understand what they want to see. Do they want to see a reduction in costs, cost by vendor, cost by process or capability? Which applications can be decommissioned? These are the types of questions that hopefully need to be answered. That then introduces the KPI. You know, are we looking at lifecycle dates here? Are we looking at vendor support dates? Are we looking at current costs or cost over the next five or 10 years? That is focusing our KPIs. Then we actually have some kind of technique to maybe calculate. So again, we can probably stick our finger in the air and choose a random value, but let's at least take an algorithmic approach to determine those if we can. And then finally, of course, the views that we're representing that information. We have to make sure that the views that we produce are useful. Um, a quick snippet, I guess, from an existing um, presentation we've done is you know, we have to choose the right chart. You know, there are various misleading charts out there, um, not necessarily from an EA perspective, but certainly maybe more from a political spectrum. Um, you have to be careful about how you view a chart or how you judge the information. You know, certainly looking at something like an application's reliability on the left here. You know, it does look like it's significantly more reliable across application one. But really, if we took a look at the data, it jumps from 94 to 95%. So a percent is obviously a significant, but certainly not as uh, misleading as the chart's implying. 
And of course, pie charts are useful, um, but do limit the number of data points you have in there. You really want to make this readable for users. So that, of course, brings us on to what we call business-friendly visualizations. Now, we have to make things dynamic. <clears throat> if we have a portfolio of over a 1,000 applications, and the last thing we want to do is provide that as a spreadsheet. And people have to navigate through a list of a 1,000 rows and see all the recommendations we're making and the cost of all those. Let's group them. Let's group them by department or line of business or capability. Make the data readable and make it usable. So this is where we're actually transforming those data points, not just into information that's usable, but actually into insights now as well. That's a single view. Of course, what's really important is to collate those into what I mentioned as being dashboards. <clears throat> so the dashboards are a key aspect of Abacus. Um, it's one of the ways we can actually communicate and embed, as I mentioned earlier on, into things like Microsoft Teams and Excel and um, Slack and SharePoint. But one of the key aspects from this dashboard perspective, um, and something I did quickly touch on during the optimization stage, is the architectures. You know, when we're actually building views in our models, um, what we're typically doing at the beginning is focusing on the current state. The as is, what do we look like now? Um, and that is important, of course. It's very difficult to know where you want to be if you don't know where you are now. It's kind of the idea of building these roadmaps. But really what we should be leveraging is this idea of having <clears throat> multiple architectures. So what that really means is if we do go through large transformation projects, we typically want to segregate that off into another state, run some analysis, see if that's worked. If it hasn't, of course, it then becomes a project that hasn't been signed off. It becomes a historical view that we can then reference in the future. That aspect is, of course, very important. Um, if we go through a digital first project that fails, if someone comes up with the same initiative in six or 12 months time, what we have as architects is a documented version of what we tried last time, why it failed, and hopefully the pitfalls we should be avoiding in the future. What it also means from a future state perspective is that ability to provide different states in time, be able to analyze those, be able to compare the changes that have happened, be able to synchronize those changes across. And it's a certainly one of the key aspects of Abacus that customers of ours have been using for well, quite a few years now, actually. Um, it's certainly one of the areas that we've provided um, a lot of insight into. Um, and certainly some of the market leading aspects of that become very useful. So optimization, of course, build dashboards with relevant information, but also make use of these different states in time especially if you're working in much more of an agile manner. These architectures could be quarters, they could be frozen, they could be reviewed and could be evolved into the next quarter. So you're providing a really good area of workflow and governance across all of that data then as well. So a quick summary, I guess um, the main thing, of course, at the beginning is to define the data and maintain that within a tool. Um, and I say within a tool, of course, the idea is the tool is there to help. Um, it's certainly and certainly the summary, are all aspects of things you hopefully should be doing anyway or um, are trying to achieve internally. And the next is, of course, is to analyze that information and actually start planning some of those changes. What roadmaps we need to produce, maybe the technology lifecycle dates, what applications are coming into production, that helps us maintain, also helps us plan anything that's coming up as well. And, and finally is to execute and optimize. So once we have that plan, we shouldn't just be sitting on it. We don't want to keep it too theoretical. These architectures are built and proven. So we need to make sure that we actually develop um, and execute the plans that we've designed with constantly, of course, optimizing that information. Now, these data points or certainly this summary, um, as much as it's around application portfolio management, I mean, it actually applies to, to most things. Um, any aspects of VA, whether it comes to process management, you'll find that these points are still relevant. They're still relevant when we start talking about infrastructure, and they're irrelevant when we talk about organizational planning or strategies. Um, I mean, they're even relevant in real life. Uh, my wife's pregnant now, so five weeks pregnant, or five weeks away from giving birth, I'd say. Um, and these are exactly the things we're doing now. You know, We're defining the data that we need. We're actually planning for the situation that's going to be coming up. And of course, what happens is we'll constantly optimize through that process. 
You know, it's about making sure that you can actually have this information at your fingertips and at least have some kind of environment that people collaborate. The final thing I guess as well is to maybe emphasize that objective-based approach. Um, well, there's a great quote that says that the world makes decisions by either guessing or using their gut and they'll either be lucky or wrong. <laughs> so the idea is to actually take hopefully a bit more of an objective approach. Data is in abundance. We're not lacking any data. What maybe we're lacking is that way of actually managing it, analyzing it, and then providing some kind of insights. So hopefully by using that four-step plan, that's exactly the stage we can get to. Regardless of what situation you're in now, we can hopefully achieve that state. So again, um, I guess thank you all for your time. Um, as usual, these TBM conferences are, are very interactive, so we'll be more than happy to reach out to anyone during the conference. Um, and likewise, reach out to us too. Um, but I do think we've probably got a few minutes for some questions at the end here as well. Um, so I'll pass back over to Sander to maybe read some of those out if any have come through. Yes, um, good morning, Andrew. I, I'm not a bit uh, not sure whether or not you are planning your pregnancy of your wife with this tool, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea, maybe I should. <laughs> a very, very interesting presentation. Currently, I'm also heading uh, application rationalization uh, charter at BEM, so it's really, really at the heart of what we're doing and the problems we are trying to solve, so really yep. recognizable. And I saw that Anna has a question. Uh, what criteria do you use for classify, classifying an application as uh, an application as being an application? Yeah, again, um, it's, a, it's a relatively... It's our uh, <laughs> lecture. <laughs> exactly. I think some of you on the call will probably appreciate that. You know, defining an application can be difficult at the beginning. Um, and it's an odd thing to say because, of course, it's the, probably the most important. If we don't know what an application is, how do we actually build these lists and actually analyze it? Um, so there are some references we can give you and um, there are some methodologies and frameworks that provide some kind of description of what an application is but as i said one of the rules of, rules of thumb i guess is, is probably some kind of internal consensus if you start asking users internally um what things they use what systems they use what do they use it for that tends to drive what an application is now as i mentioned earlier on you know, people say an excel spreadsheet is an application um, and that's justified in some cases. It's providing functionality, it's providing an output, people use it, there's a cost associated to it. So there is a bit of difficulty in a, let's say, a, a single overall definition, but certainly how it's used, who's using it, and what it's used for will hopefully help classify things initially. Yeah, and if I may add to that, uh, because we had the same problem at our yeah. organization and what I used just to be pragmatic is everything that was reported by our scanning tool, we had Snow as a scanning tool, was an application. And then the consequence is that you have thousands of applications, but at least it was a starting point. Exactly, yes. Yes. Um, I have one, I also have a question um, sure. regarding, yeah, where do you start? Because immediately you get a lot of, a lot of information. Uh, you get thousands of applications, uh, mm -hmm. 10, 20 different perspectives. Uh, well, you immediately have a, a lot of relationships uh, with, between the applications. Where do you start with an organization? What, what can you have, do you have some advice on that? Yeah, definitely. I think um, there's always an aspect of starting small, which I think is the key thing initially. Um, again, I mentioned there's a lot of data. You certainly don't want it to be overwhelming. Um, a lot of it is classifying what applications you should be focusing on. So whether they are applications that are tied to specific projects or programs that you're running internally, um, applications that have a high level of criticality maybe, those are maybe where the focus should be, or certainly from a cost perspective, maybe focus on the portfolios that cost the most if that's one of the objectives. Um, but it's always important to, to understand that, of course, you, know, you always have to ask the question why and it's what we do as consultants you know if we have a customer come up to us and say you know hey we want to import a list of 50,000 servers or applications into abacus you know, the question is why what's it being used for what's the analysis that's being done what are the outputs that you're expecting that's one of the drivers here as well you know there has to be some kind of deliverable at the end of this it shouldn't just be we need to build a portfolio of applications certainly it gives you uh, a view of the landscape 
Um, but you need to be using that data to transfer that into information, as you've heard throughout the rest of the, the speaker sessions today as well. Okay, thank you very much. I think there are no more questions and we are approaching lunch. Uh, let me see. Oh, there's one question from Paul. Oh, sure. uh, <laughs> yes, the first task is to set clear definitions for application solution capab cap capability, then set at which level you will manage it. So I think that's an advice, not some sort of question. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I think capabilities are important. You know, we've talked before about reference models and capability planning. Um, you have to have some kind of level of the business aspects. Otherwise, the applications exist in isolation. You know, what are they yes. actually supporting is important. And I even saw a capability model in the presentation that you used, I think. Exactly, yeah. So there are industry reference ones, APQC, yeah. BIAN. There's a whole bunch available that we can give some best recommendations on. Yes. Oh, there's another question um the last one before lunch do you separate applications and tools in the list you are preparing for example excel could be a tool in my opinion yeah again a very interesting one um and it's interesting that of course the majority of the questions do tend to stem around you know what is an application still <laughs> um and so it's certainly an ongoing conversation we'll have and, and yes it could be a tool it could be a product it could be a solution um again the definitions and the terminology we use you know, it's important. There has to be some kind of consensus. There has to be you know, an aspect of architecture is making sure people all understand the information. So having a consistent terminology is key. Um, certainly deciding what that should be on this call is maybe a step too far, but it's certainly something we'll reach out to you and help you understand as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Andrew. And back to Jonathan, I think.